All right. Good evening, everybody. Adequate notice of this meeting, as required by the Open Public Meetings Act, was provided through the posting, mailing, and filing of the annual notice of regularly scheduled meetings of the Town Council on December 11, 2020. The notice was on that date posted on the bulletin board in the municipal building, provided to the Westfield leader in the Star Ledger, and filed with the clerk of the Town of Westfield. Mrs. Raleigh, may I have a roll call? Mayor Brindle? Here. Council members have good? Here. Farmily? Here. Agrippo? Here. Katz? Here. Mackey? Here. Contract? Here. Dardia? Here. Boyce? Here. Please rise for the invocation, which will be given by Councilman Lagrippo, and remain standing for the flag. Thank you, Mayor. Loving Lord, we thank you that you listen to us. Please help us listen to each other. May each of us around this table really hear what our team members are saying. Enable us to acquire and understand the accurate information we need and its implications so that we can inform, make informed decisions. Help us hear the complete message being communicated. Help us to get distracted by things within or within, with outside this room. Help us avoid thinking of what we want to say when we should instead be listening and absorbing what is being communicated. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, uh, Jim, do you have any updates? Before I get my comments, Mayor, I'd like to just make a quick presentation and uh, I want to invite Greg O'Neill, Public Works Director, and Rich Eubanks, our Parks and Fuels Director, as well as our Recycling Corner up here real quick. To make their way up here. Um, we uh, were recently recognized by the New Jersey Department of, of um, um, Environmental Protection, uh, thanks to the Green Team in Westfield, Catherine Shaji, I want to call her out. She was very kind to assist us in making application to the DEP to be recognized for recycling efforts in the town of Westfield. And most of you know we have a curbside recycling program, which we've had for many, many years. Uh, but we actually have a very robust recycling center, uh, conservation center, uh, where we've had actually amazing recycling opportunities been added to in the past number of years. And that's a, a testament to really these two gentlemen standing here, uh, Public Works Director Greg O'Neill and Rich Banks, who's actually our recycling coordinator. And these recycling efforts we have, we've had the normal things for years, you know, commingled cardboard, newspaper, those things. We've added a lot of items in the past few years, uh, unique items, uh, uh, I guess, mattresses, corks, batteries, tennis balls. Um, yeah, um, so again, some of these are not the easiest thing to uh, accommodate, but both these gentlemen here, open minds, um, and uh, we've accommodated everything, uh, everything to even including food waste, um, and basically been highly successful. And we are now recognized by the Department of, Ed of Environmental Protection as one of the best towns in the state for recycling efforts and innovation in recycling. Uh, and really we're being sought after for many communities and towns around us to see how they can participate in our program. Reminder that recycling is free to anyone, uh, no permits required. The only thing in our center where permits are required is where you uh, actually dispose of organic debris. Uh, but we have a very active center and our Union County is uh, one of our biggest advocates for our center. Uh, they actually use it as a model for the rest of the, the uh, recycling places in the state of New Jersey. So I just wanted to present this to uh, Rich Eubanks and Greg O'Neill, which is New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection presents a certificate to the Town of Westfield Department of Public Works for outstanding achievement in recycling. And you guys can take it. Thank you, Mr. Gilday. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mayor Brindle, ladies and gentlemen of council. Uh, this was truly a conglomeration of effort. It wasn't just myself and Rich. Uh, it was our green team. It's Councilman Contract. Uh, it was a lot of people who put this together. And working together with these groups has really expanded the opportunities at the Conservation Center. So one of the things that we do always uh, want people to come up to us, find out more about it. Uh, if you're in there, please feel free to speak to us, answer, ask any questions you'd like to, uh, because we're more than happy to continue to grow and expand what we have going on there. 
So we look forward to the future with our conservation center. Uh, quick, uh, quick story, when I first came here, uh, it was, uh, I think, two or three dumpsters and many large piles of dirt. And in the <laughs> meantime, uh, Chris McLuhan, our former engineer, had a full plan ready to go. Uh, we implemented that plan, got it together, reorganized, and grew and expanded the center. So it's been a lot of fun, and we look forward to our future there. Thanks very much. Chris Eubanks says thank you as well. <laughs> what do you say? Not, not a fan of public speaking. Jim, Jim, can I just yes. say a few yeah, things? Sure. So, yeah. yep. uh, first of all, I think uh, besides the great efforts of Greg and Rich and the Green Team, um, I want to thank the residents for participating in these programs. Right? They're only as good as the participation. I think everybody should know that we collected 240 tons of debris that was recycled last year and not thrown out, not incinerated. So that is tremendous. And just to, to just bring to life some of the programs, because um, actually I'm surprised not every resident knows about everything that you can recycle for free at the Conservation Center. But plastic bags of all kinds, even your dry cleaning, you know, the, the wrapping. Styrofoam, um, Union County, we represent 50% of the styrofoam collected and recycled in the county, just here in Westfield. That tells you how much people are buying, <laughs> getting shipped to their house. Number five, plastics, um, food waste, which was mentioned. I do want to make a comment about Rich. Rich goes out of his way to solve challenges and make these programs work, and he is he is being his typical, I don't want to take any credit, but he really deserves a lot of credit. And I'll just give you everybody a quick example. So um, actually, I'm going to go back to the plastic bags. We launched the program with Trex. So I don't know if anybody has Trex flooring, but it's composite wood. And they will collect plastic bags at grocery stores. We were bringing the plastic bags, and we had such a volume, we had to go find another grocery store. We are doing Acme, right, Rich, and Clark? and stop and shop here in Westfield. Well, both of them said it's too much. We can't handle your, your amount of plastic bags. Rich found another vendor where in, I think 30 or 40 miles from here to restore the program and keep it going. That's, that's the care that Rich brings to the table. So I just wanna say thank you because this wouldn't happen without his hard work and effort. But also corks, a lot of wine is being consumed in Westfield. <laughs> um, fluorescent bulbs, household batteries, tennis balls, books, and crayons. Uh, so please take advantage of it because it's, it's good for the environment and uh, it's, a, it's, it's the right thing to do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for indulging me on that. A um, couple of comments. Um, leaf collection. So leaf collection brochures are out. Uh, everyone should have received it at their home by now. Um, the center is now open seven days a week. Uh, started actually yesterday or this past weekend. Um, and it's, it's Monday through Friday, 9 to 2.30. Saturday and Sunday is 9 to 3. Uh, we are actually giving out the free bags again for leaf collection. We started that program last year. Uh, and so you can pick up the bags anytime the center is open. Uh, proof of residency, not, not a permit. Is re you don't need a permit for the center to get bags, just a proof of residency when you go in there. And then we have uh, multiple pallets of bags ready to go. Um, also, the, the big thing, the big change this year in the, in the lead collection program is really uh, the, if you looked at the, the schedule, the schedule is very similar to what it's been in the past. I know I, I'm in zone five, so I know the guys come to my house usually uh, the week before Thanksgiving, the week of Thanksgiving, depending on the year. Um, and, uh, and then they come back again, uh, you know, four or five weeks later. Um, so the schedule that's in the brochure is actually the same schedule. The difference is, we're asking everybody this year, first year of the program, um, it actually tells you the week to put your leaves out and the week will be in front of your area. So that we're trying to limit the amount of time leaves are in the street. And today's storm is a very good example of that. Um, not many leaves have fell yet, but those that have fallen actually clogged the drains. So we're trying to, beginning to begin to change the culture of getting the leaves out in the street only a few days before or a week before they're actually picked up. Uh, so it's a first, first year of this program, but we're thinking that's a, a very good way to do this. And the schedule in the brochure, it basically tells you the week you're supposed to put leaves in the street and the week will be by to get it. Uh, so that's a change this year. Hopefully it'll be a much more efficient process and efficient for our people picking up the leaves. Um, and actually um, what's in the schedule is a two passes. We always have two passes that we actually schedule and they're listed there. We always have a third pass though. The third pass is always the pass where after the first two heavy passes are done, 
it's really what we call the remnant pass, the pass where most leaves are gone but some are not. So that can't be scheduled as cleanly because the guys can move very fast or very slow depending on where the volume of leaves are. But we always do a third <laughs> pass, uh, and that will continue as well. Um, and another thing to say, again, back to the leaves in the street. Um, again, we're trying to, this is the first year of the program um, where we're telling you when to put your leaves down and when you, when you shouldn't put them out. Uh, and when we'll get them. This leads into the recent committee that was formed, the West Hill Infrastructure Resiliency Committee, uh, which actually has its first meeting scheduled for November 10th. And the purpose of this committee really was after the uh, effects of uh, uh, Tropical Storm Hurricane Ida in West Hill and all over the state of New Jersey, uh, a new committee was formed to kind of look at um, resiliency, uh, storm water systems we have in town, uh, where the issues are, what can we do to um, improve them in certain places. Uh, if not the entire town. So that's something we're starting, and this is really a piece of the puzzle, leaf collection uh, and leaves in the street is a piece of that puzzle, but we're hoping to have, at the end of this process, uh, a very comprehensive program with uh, multiple short-term, mid-term, long-term recommendations, as well as maybe zoning change recommendations, uh, building department change recommendations, et cetera, coming out so we can actually hit all the facets that might affect stormwater drainage in some way, shape, or form on private properties, public properties, et cetera. So, very excited to start that process, and I don't know, I know Councilman Habgood and uh, uh, Councilman Contract are, are chairing that committee with some town professionals. We have eight residents who were appointed through the application process, and we'll look, you might want to make comments later on that as well, but uh, very excited about that opportunity. Um, one other thing about paving. So paving, uh, as I mentioned many times here, the town's programs for paving is finished except for one road. Our last state aid uh, approved road is Willow Grove Road. Uh, we do expect uh, concrete work to start uh, tomorrow on that road, handicap ramps, et cetera. And we're scheduling to have milling and paving done next week when the school is uh, in half days and, and uh, on vacation the last two days of next week for the teacher's convention. Uh, it's a road that is obviously adjacent to uh, 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 Tamaqua School and of course has access to Tamaqua Park. Um, so that's hopefully gonna be done next week and starting this week, uh, Elizabethtown Gas uh, is still in the process of doing a lot of gas main replacement work as well as looking to pave a lot of the roads that are finished with the gas main replacement work. So in the next two to three weeks, we expect to have um, the grid of Columbus Avenue, Grandview, Irving, Ripley, Pine, Sycamore, and Elizabeth. That grid, uh, most of them are entire lengths and some partial lengths of road. That Elizabethtown gas will come out paved curb to curb um, uh, with the, with the uh, limits that have been established. The other grid that is looking to be done uh, the next couple of weeks too is Paulstead, Cumberland, Downer, Drake, Hort, and Roosevelt. So those are two areas that are done with all the gas main work. They're obligated to come in and pave and of course restripe as what existed before. Um, so that's gonna be happening. They're also working on some other grids where the gas main work is not completed yet. Uh, and those are in process. We're hoping to get them done in November, but again, the window of uh, paving is closing. We also have Hillside Avenue, uh, which is also now finished. Hillside transcends not only Westfield, but, but Mountainside. We've uh, worked out a deal with Mountainside to pave that entire uh, roadway meaning Elizabeth Town gas paving it. We expect that to be done in the next few weeks. Uh, Dudley Avenue, uh, all the house connections and main replacement is basically done. They're waiting for a uh, high pressure um, uh, pipe to be, uh, to be installed. Uh, once that is done, they'll be able to pave the road, hoping that happens in November as well. And that's a long stretch of road, as you know, Dudley from uh, Mountain to North Avenue. There's a section of North Avenue needs to be paved as well. Um, and so a lot of paving coming up in November. Um, hopefully the weather cooperates. Uh, a lot of inconvenience in certain times and places. We're gonna to try to limit that as best we can. Elizabethtown Gas Paving Contractor has been very efficient, very good when they've done this the past few years for us. So we're excited about that process, but trying to get as many roads done this year as we can so we have less to carry over for next year. Lastly, um, we've been talking about this one project for quite a while, Union County uh, traffic light installations. Uh, if you remember, we have two lights that they approved some time ago, one at West Broad and Scotch Plains, one at Lambert's Mill and Railway. All of the pre-work has been done, paving, handicap ramps, striping, everything's ready to go. With everything else going on in the world, of course, there's a delay on material delivery. Um, so they've been slowly getting some of the control mechanisms in. They're still waiting for some more control mechanisms <coughs> and actual light posts and stanchions themselves. They uh, advised our town engineer today that they expect all the equipment to be in by mid-November. If that's the case, they'll begin installation after that time. Uh, so we're very excited about those two safety uh, enhancements to those two areas being go going in. Hopefully by mid-November it will start. Um, those are my comments, Mayor. Any questions? 
I just have a quick one, Jim. So if roads, if they don't finish the gas meter hookups and therefore roads can't be paved, do they come back and do better patching ahead of the winter time? Yes, and so uh, yes, they'll come back and do better patching for the head of the winter time. And um, frankly, you know, our engineer has mentioned this to me as well. In some cases, you want the, the trenching or the patches to settle. Um, sometimes going through a winter is not the, not everybody wants, but actually it provides for a better road in the long term because then you have settle and then another patch on top. So when they mill the road, you're actually having a good surface. Uh, but yes, if, if indeed they have to go through the winter, they'll come back and do final patching for the winter, which we want as well for plowing opportunities. So. Right. Okay. Yep. Good. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Jim. Um, I have a bit of an update tonight, so uh, bear with me. Uh, I just remind everybody that public comment is only accepted live in person. So uh, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, you know, um, it, no comments will be allowed there. And it's also replayed on YouTube and TV 36. Um, so we had a really great announcement in town yesterday. Uh, hopefully you saw the great news that the Rialto is being purchased by the Westfield Arts Collective, which is a nonprofit that was formed by a group of courageous and talented residents um, who uh, took a chance on purchasing that iconic building. Uh, the vision for the Center for Creativity at the Rialto is one that prioritizes the arts and both the community anchor and what we hope is gonna be an economic driver for a downtown and hopefully an arts district in our downtown. And it would not have happened without the, um, the, the work and, uh, and uh, commitment of a lot of residents as well as a partnership with the T and Charles Adams Foundation. But I thought what I would do is just provide a little bit of background because everybody saw the announcement, but this has been really a groundwork that has been laid, a lot done by this council for the last three years. Um, and it was one that even before the theater closed back in 2018, when we established Adams Fest and began to develop a relationship with uh, really at the leadership of Councilman Don Mackey with the T and Charles Adams Foundation and who was located in Long Island. And uh, that relationship continued to flourish under the executive director, Kevin Mezaraki, um, who then became involved in our annual festivities that relates to uh, Adams Fest honoring the legacy and art of Charles Adams. Then in 2019, we actually established the Public Arts Commission, also something that was supported by this, uh, the, by this council, and again, under Councilman Mackey's guidance. And that provided the foundation for really an emphasis on the arts in Westfield and the value of public art. And you saw it through the Ricardo Roeg murals on the south side, the Art Takes Flight exhibit, and then, and then most recently, the, um, uh, the, the photo exhibit that we just had through the lens, and then the newly unveiled murals on the Central Avenue underpass. It was also a long time that we started a relationship with the owners of the Rialto, Jesse and Doreen Sage. Um, and that began long before the pandemic, and it's one that they've had deep roots in Westfield and cared deeply about sustaining that building um, for something for the arts. Um, and then just prior to the pandemic and shortly after they announced the closing of the Rialto, we formed a Rialto Rising Volunteer Committee. And that was comprised of a bunch of residents who had all expressed an interest in saving the Rialto and who had a huge variety of experience in both the arts, commercial real estate, um, finance, and who all stepped up to share their experience to help see how we could save the Rialto. Then in August of 2020, we designated the property as an area in need of redevelopment. And that was really, really important because in or what that requires, it requires a redevelopment agreement to be drafted and it was adopted by this council to ensure that we would retain control over the site um, and any change of use uh, that would have to be approved for that building. Um, and we are obviously hoping for the best outcome for the community. Um, and that, that redevelopment agreement was really critical to the conversations with the property owner about ensuring that it stayed something that benefited the arts. Um, I just wanna also clear up any misperceptions that redevelopment designations are always the equivalent of tax abatements. That's absolutely not the case, and this is an example of that. Redevelopment designations allow us to create redevelopment agreements to let us retain control over the site, which is exactly what happened with the Rialto. Um, and that is absolutely what gave us a lot of an ability to work with them to, to, towards the announcement that we saw yesterday. And then finally, and very importantly, in October of 2020, we passed an ordinance that changed the zoning for the town's business district, allowing artisan manufacturing. Um, and that is the creation of traditional and non-traditional art. And that is something that obviously Don really spearheaded. 
And that is really what is based, the Center for Creativity is based upon creating a maker space for a variety of artisans. Um, and we and this council once again changed the zoning law to allow that to happen. And so I just bring that background to say that all of this doesn't happen in a vacuum and it's often not one thing it's a it's a, a sequence of decisions that enable to enable us to deliver really great outcomes um, and that's what we saw yesterday which laid the foundation for these residents to come together and create this nonprofit so um, it really was a terrific example of a lot of vision and a lot of courage and a lot of people coming together so uh, what's great is the outpouring of support from um, the residents after yesterday's announcement. I think they've already gotten donations, they've already gotten volunteers. I've heard from a lot of people about how they can help with an amazing outside of Westfield and beyond. Um, and so it's really, I think it really was um, a huge boost, I think, for the community. The downtown businesses are thrilled. So please um, get involved. Uh, please follow the Center for Creativity at the Rialto and all their social media. Um, uh, uh, go to their website, and, uh, we, and there's, there's going to be a ribbon cutting on Thursday at 5, and we're very excited about that as the official kickoff for this great, um, this great new uh, venture downtown. Um, and then on a separate note regarding Westfield Senior Housing, which I know is something that's in the news, I know that there's people that represent them here tonight. Um, I, was, uh, I did have a group of uh, <coughs> residents from the complex visit me last week, um, invited Jim to come join, and I definitely want to thank them um, for the several that came and visited to voice their support for the town's efforts to resolve the current lease dispute and for bravely sharing their concerns with me about the diminishing services in their buildings. I reiterated the town's commitment to maintaining their affordable senior housing and reaffirmed what they already knew to be true, which is that their housing or rents will not be impacted in any way due to this lease dispute. Uh, this administration remains resolute and steadfast in acting in the best interest of these senior residents and our taxpayers and will not be intimidated by any scare tactics just weeks before an election. Uh, I also want to thank the other residents who have also reached out to share their knowledge about the operations of the buildings to aid us in our effort to gain additional information that we have not been able to, um, to gain to date. On a separate note and good news, I am pleased to report that the South Avenue train station kiosk, which hopefully will be in operation soon when we actually have more commuters coming back, um, that at last night's meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission, they voted unanimously to nominate the South Avenue train station kiosk for historic designation. Uh, the commission's report um, was, uh, indicates that it's one of the last remaining exterior newsstands and uh, Councilman Hapgood, who is the liaison to the HPC, do you want to have any comments on that? Yeah, I did, it was interesting last night to learn more of the history of, um, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Right. It was interesting last night to learn more of the history of the kiosk. It was actually built in 1894 and um, was originally on the, um, on the north side of the train station. It was moved to the south side, um, but it's been, uh, you know, very much um, an iconic structure, not only for its architecture, but, um, you know, in delivering the news. So we didn't really realize how historic it was until we started doing the research and we're really excited to now have the chance to designate it after it's become so beautifully preserved. So. And it will be the seventh designation that we will have in just uh, in the last three and a half years, something I think we're really proud of, right? I, I, another. Think, I, I think it actually might be the eighth. Oh. And, and uh, there's another one coming. A, a resident in Stonely Park has expressed an interest in um, putting our house up for designation. So. That's great. Yeah, great. And, um, <coughs> and then also in historic preservation news, I attended last week's Devlin Awards, which recognize achievements in historic preservation. Um, I was there with Jim Gilday, and who accepted an award for the Mindewaskum Playground. But uh, fittingly, the ceremony was held at Lions Roar Brewery, which was also one of the award recipients for its incredible and wonderful restoration. So just once again, um, very thrilled that historic preservation is a high priority for this community. Um, and I think the volunteer designations that we're seeing come forth reflect that, we've, uh, that people understand how valuable it is. So thank you for that. Just related, we've heard a lot about voting. I just want to remind everybody, there's three different ways you can vote this year. Vote by mail. If you have your vote by mail ballot, please get it in right away. If you got one and you show up at your November 2nd polling station, you cannot vote with the lever. You have to vote by provisional ballot only. So just, just think about that. Um, the best place to do uh, drop it off is to take it to the um, 
you know, the, uh, the Frazier building on North Avenue and drop it in the secure lockbox there. Um, and you actually have uh, until, I think, uh, to get a vote by mail ballot until November 1st, you can go apply in person. Um, you can vote early in person, at, but closest location for us is Union County College at the auditorium. I've actually had talked to several people who have gone that said it was a snap and easy, convenient, um, and it is open every day through Halloween, is that Sunday, um, from 10 to 8 p.m. Sunday they close at 6 the last day, so uh, I encourage you to go there if you can. And then of course you can vote in person on election day in your usual poll if you have voted in person. Um, and just lastly, um, there was some, attended some great ribbon cuttings recently. There seems to be a flurry of new businesses in town. Um, thrilled to go to the beautiful ribbon cutting for the new Mimian Hill pop-up shop across from Adams Tavern. Um, Miriam Silver and Hillary Kaplan, the owners of that, have doubled down on their investment in Westfield. We hope that they do such gangbuster business over the holidays that they will choose to stay in that location, so please shop there. Um, and then on Thursday, we are doing a ribbon cutting for the highly anticipated Karma, Karma EV dealership on North Avenue, which really is good speaking to the market for sustainability here in town and in the area, I should say. And then there's another ribbon cutting happening tomorrow for Blissful, Blissful Beauty, which is an independent cosmetics and fragrance, fragrance store in the former East uh, L.L. Lore space. So congrats on these, uh, on these grand openings, and hopefully we look forward to having many more. Uh, and, um, and lastly... And very importantly, uh, something um, that certainly was a uh, collective uh, trauma that our town went through, uh, and, and that related to the, um, the, uh, this, this invasion and sexual assault that happened on Longfellow Avenue last week. I want to thank everyone for their outpouring of compassion for our fellow resident and neighbor and who suffered that unthinkable uh, home invasion and assault last Tuesday. I had the opportunity to meet with her briefly and convey the support of the community as we all continue to keep her in our thoughts and prayers. As I said last week, this series of events have left us all very shaken as we try to process how this could have happened to our neighbor in the middle of the afternoon, right in our own home. An act like this preys on upon our worst fears and exposes our vulnerabilities in a place where, in, in a place where no one should ever have to feel unsafe. I'm very grateful to the entire Westfield Police Department who worked swiftly and tirelessly in partnership with both the Union County Prosecutor's Office and the New Jersey State Police to bring this suspect under arrest. Through their extraordinary police work, the Westfield PD had the suspect under surveillance within 24 hours of the assault. And with the arrest has brought this case one step closer to the justice that the victim deserves. I'm going to have Chief Badalora uh, speak briefly in a bit about some of the details in the timeline he's now able to release, but I first want to emphasize that this is a case that still has to go through a fair judicial process, and that means that some de details will have to be preserved for that time. But I did want to say I had the privilege of having a first-hand look uh, inside at the level of professionalism and commitment that our department brought to this case reflective of the recent professional accreditation, which is attained by only 4% of police departments nationwide. I am proud that this administration continues to fully support Chief Battalore's leadership and the department's commitment to community policing, not only in words but in deeds, which is why if you fully restore their funding for officers and equipment, our support is also reflected in, the, in our confidence in them as they upheld the integrity of an investigation and ultimately a legal case they were building in spite of the community's cries for immediate information because they were legitimately afraid. Our support is also reflected in upholding the department's requests for signage about car thefts and notifications about where and when crime is occurring, in spite of criticism from those who believe that that information should not be shared. I feel like when we have a professionalism and accreditation at the level of our police department, they deserve to be able to provide the advice, as, and, 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 we, and I think we owe them that. I only say this to reiterate that we have one of the top police departments, not just in the state, but in the country, reflected in the swift, swift arrest that they made for one of the most heinous crimes a community could ever experience. The best show of support is to place our trust in them and in their professional judgment as to when we can communicate details of a crime. And we as a community are very, very thankful for their incredible work over the past week and every day. And with that, I'd like to ask Chief Laura to come up and address some of the comments.
Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. On Tuesday, October 19th, at approximately 1241 hours, the Westfield Police Department responded to a home invasion and sexual assault that had just occurred on the 400 block of Longfellow Avenue. All available police force sources were assigned to respond. This not only included patrol officers, but also detectives and headquarters command staff. Upon their arrival, all of them went immediately to work. Searches for the suspect were initiated by patrol officers on the ground, both by police vehicles and on foot, and with the use of a Union County Sheriff's Office canine. A search was also conducted by air through the use of a Westfield Police Department drone. Without a moment of delay, our detectives began a very extensive canvas of the neighborhood, interviewing persons, reviewing available residential camera footage, and collecting evidence and other important information. They were able to definitively determine that the suspect had already successfully fled the area and was no longer located within the confines of the town of Westfield, and that he did not present any further threat to our community. But make no mistake, what occurred here was a most despicable crime. And this suspect was, without a doubt, a significant danger to the safety of innocent people. Due to the exceptionally dedicated efforts of our detectives, working in conjunction with investigators from the Sex Crimes Unit of the Union County Prosecutor's Office, Terrence J. Rue, age 22, of Plainfield, was subsequently arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree aggravated sexual assault, two counts of first-degree robbery, one count of third-degree burglary, and two counts of fourth-degree unlawful possession of a weapon. This arrest was made following the execution of a search warrant at his West End Plainfield residence on the evening of Thursday, October 21st. I cannot say enough about the outstanding efforts of our detectives working together with the Union County Prosecutor's Office and with the help of the New Jersey State Police. They were able to identify the suspect in a little over 24 hours, build their case, have a search warrant issued, and an arrest made in just a little over 48 hours. These types of crimes do not occur very often in our town, and I am very much aware of the extraordinary fear this one created in our community. It undoubtedly impacted each and every one of us. To make an arrest so quickly in a case like this is the exception. It is not the rule. Every single one of our detectives and detective supervisors were assigned, and they worked tirelessly around the clock to bring this arrest to fruition. During this dis investigation, immediate and critical decisions had to be made, decisions which would undoubtedly impact our ability to successfully investigate this matter and to maintain the confidentiality and integrity of that investigation. I stand fully behind those decisions and would like to briefly address two of them in particular. One was a decision to lift a shelter in place order that was in effect at two area schools. A thorough search of the crime scene and the surrounding areas was conducted. As I stated, not just by officers, but also by a dog and even a drone. We determined with certainty the suspect had successfully fled the area, that he was no longer in the town of Westfield, and that he presented no threat whatsoever to our children. The other was a decision to withhold certain information, information we deemed absolutely essential for us to withhold, as its knowledge could have serious implications on our ability to quickly, properly, and with certainty identify our suspect. Information which, had we made it public, could have negatively and irrevocably impacted our investigation. We started this investigation with absolutely nothing. And as I said, within 24 hours, we identified a suspect. He no doubt was a tremendous danger to the public, but once identified, he was placed under constant watchful eyes and remained so to ensure he could not strike again. This while we built our probable cause to apply for and execute a search warrant. And in a little over 48 hours, that search warrant execution resulted in probable cause to make an arrest. 
This is how you build a case. That was outstanding police work. I will tell you, I've been a police officer for almost 25 years, and I often describe my career as a series of highs and lows. In one single 48-hour time period, I experienced the lowest of lows and then the highest as highs, as did many of our detectives. It was, without a doubt, the most intense stress I have ever experienced. I can appreciate the feelings of our entire community. As a father, a husband, a person who loves this town, but most importantly, as your chief of police, the person charged with protecting our residents. And I can tell you this, no one in this police department is celebrating the arrest of Terrence J. Rue. There is absolutely nothing we can do to fix what happened to our victim, to replace what was so very wrongly taken from her, or to make her feel safe and whole again. I know that. We all know that. We are simply extraordinarily grateful, each and every one of us who was involved in this investigation, is grateful to have been assigned a role, to have played a part, and to have done our jobs. This event demonstrates that violent crime can and does exist absolutely everywhere, regardless of geography or demographic, and it can occur at any time. I do not have answers for you as to why this happened in Westfield, or why in that neighborhood, or on that street, or why our victim was targeted. We may never have answers to those questions. This arrest is not a time for us to celebrate, but rather it is a time for us to come together as a community, and to look out for and to love one another. We cannot take our safety and security for granted because it is not guaranteed. We can do more, we must do more, and I am certain, forward, certain going forward we will do more to make our safety and security and that of our friends and neighbors a priority. I stood before this governing body following an incident at Tamaquis Elementary School in June of 2019. I told you to have trust and to have faith and confidence in your police. And tonight, I stand before you once again and ask you for the very same thing. I cannot always promise an arrest in these types of situations, but I can promise you that you will always get our absolute best. As Chief of Police, it is my job to deliver that to you. And once again, our officers did not fail you. Now to the meeting at hand. Thank you, Chief. May I have a motion to approve the minutes from the Town Council Conference Meeting Executive Session and Regular Meeting of October 12, 2021? Moved. So moved by Councilman Mackey. Second? Second. Second by Councilman Magrippo. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. Opposed? This motion is carried. Mrs. Rowley, do we have any petitions or communications? No, Mayor, we do not. Now it's time for open discussion by citizens. Anyone may come up to the microphone and speak to the council on any subject on which we have jurisdiction. Please state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to 10 minutes, please. <coughs> Mayor and council people, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Jerry Robinson. Thought he was gonna arrest me there for a second. <laughs> I didn't do anything. My name is Jerry Robinson. I live at 1125 Tice Place in Westfield, New Jersey. My wife and I have lived in Westfield for 37 plus years. And we've raised four children who all attended and graduated from Westfield schools. We've 
one time or another have been involved in the different things in the, in the community. Uh, <coughs> the last eight years, I've been involved with the Westfield Senior Citizen Housing Corporation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. And uh, I'm here tonight to respond to Mayor Brindle's attack <clears throat> on Westfield Senior Citizen Housings with the accusations that the organization owes the town rent and that it has not paid. From the start of <coughs> Westfield Senior negotiations on a new lease with the town, which is well over three years ago, Westfield leaders have made it clear they have only one priority, money. The town's intentions and sarcastic comments have been made clear behind closed doors in these negotiations and now publicly. After seeking to tarnish Westfield Senior's reputation, the town has now taken more drastic action by threatening to terminate Westfield Senior's lease right at Christmas time. Instead of negotiating in good faith to strengthen and continue this relationship, Westfield is aiming to reduce a relationship of 45 years down to mere weeks, and in doing so, the town is creating additional uncertainty for seniors. The way Mayor Brindle has tried to portray Westfield Senior is in stark opposition to the way Department of Housing and Urban Development in New Jersey and New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agencies see us. They both hold Westfield Senior up as an example that offer affordable housing organizations and municipalities around the state and country should emulate. <clears throat> the town of Westfield does not contribute a dollar to help aid the quality of life for these seniors, nor has Westfield Senior ever asked for additional funding. Yet, when the town asked its accountant to evaluate the lease agreement, it claimed that federal and state grants Westfield Senior received to provide services for seniors should be counted as revenue. These grants are not revenue. The money does not belong to Westfield Senior Citizen Housing or the town of Westfield. It belongs to the seniors and has been rightfully and legally passed on to them through services provided such as transportation, activities, access to educational and wellness programs. Now, with our lease up for renewal, the town is stating that Westfield Senior owes over $4 million that per leases and financial agreement, it is not owed. We do not, nor have we ever admitted to owing the town this or any money. Le leaking incomplete documents on social media without context does not change that. And keep in mind, every additional dollar given to the town is a dollar taken from the seniors. Westfield Senior and the town are in litigation in order to settle this matter fairly and appropriately. What is not in dispute is that we are the single highest contributor to Westfield's annual budget. In 2021 alone, <clears throat> excuse me, we are projected to pay the town approximately $400,000. And since 2010, we have paid over two and a half million dollars to the town. In the town of Westfield, if the town of Westfield takes control over operations of these buildings in 60 days, instead of receiving annual rent, a bill for the cost of operations and capital expenses will be added to the tax bill of the town of Westfield homeowners for the sum of $2 million a year. Can you imagine what that's going to do to our tax, our property tax? Mayor Brindle, you are right. This is not a typical deal. Most nonprofit affordable housing organizations around the state and country own the land, not lease it, and pay a fraction of what we currently pay annually. These organizations are also lauded by the towns they are in and work cooperatively to provide the best programs and services for their residents. Now the town of Westfield is demanding more than double our annual rate 
to amend these leases and who's trying to access money that cannot be touched by law. The reserves that we hold stand as an example of ex exemplary management and do not exist as a source of revenue for the town of Westfield. We keep appropriate funds available for maintenance and improvements to our buildings. We also have funds set aside to add 31 new affordable housing units to the site. These plans have already been approved by the town, but we cannot move ahead until the town's leadership and Westfield Senior agree on a new lease. On our end, it is not politics or partisanship, as can be seen by the diverse array of our supporters. Westfield Senior loves our town and the many good things that are happening here. We are not asking for preferential treatment or a sweetheart deal. We are asking for a fair, equitable agreement so that we can build on the foundation of the past 45 years and continue providing safe, secure, and affordable housing for our valuable members of our community. That's not just better for our seniors. It's better for all of Westfield. Thank you for your time and attention. Videos? My name is Jerome Fader. I live at 789 Nola Terrace uh, in Westfield. I've been a resident for 44 years. Uh, my subject is the proposed addition of lighting to Edison. I've been concerned about the impacts. Uh, I was looking at Sid Fay Field on Ryeway Avenue, and the lights are very bright, visible a distance away, and I, and I think unsuitable. <clears throat> I was told that these are the old lights and that new LED lights have much less impact. So I'm a retired engineer, and I sit out with a light meter and a ruler to explore that claim. I also solicit suggestions from coaches and, and other, uh, other uh, experts around the town as to what other fields I should look at. And I came up with uh, three fields. Um, I guess Sid Fay was one of them. It has railroad tracks on one side, non-residential areas on two sides and is quite a distance from the nearest uh, residence across Huawei Avenue. I didn't measure the distance to the nearest residence, but it looked like uh, at least uh, 70 feet. Oak Ridge Park is a very modern f facility. Um, it, it's large, beautiful spread with fields and abundance of space. I didn't see any residence or anything nearby that the fields could impact. Uh, Scotch Plains High School another large facility with an abundance of space. Uh, there did appear to be some residences about 70 to 80 feet away, but nothing like the density and closeness of residences that we see at, at Edison. Uh, by comparison, Edison Field has residences on three sides, some as close as 15 feet from the property boundary. Uh, I measured the light right under the pole, and the light fall off with distance from the poles on which the lights were measured. Uh, uh, the, right, the revised Edison plan, plan uses lights mounted on, on, the, on poles right on the edge of the field. Um, so I, and I also measured the light fall off with distance from uh, well-lit areas such as the edge of the field. And if you look at the, uh, there's a, a, I guess the third slide there, there's a summary of the uh, light measurements. Uh, the tight, top row of this is the, uh, gives the um, uh, light at the uh, field edge, a white line. Uh, then the, I measured the light at the pole, 
and then I measured 40, right, 40 feet from, the, uh, from that line. Uh, all the measurements were, uh, I guess the measurements are in foot candles, and uh, I guess all, uh, uh, well, Westfield has an ordinance that limits light to adjacent uh, properties of 0.3 foot candles, and all of the measurements, including the most distant ones, were well over the, uh, the Westfield limit. So as a result, so none of the field lighting examined would work in Westfield. The light falls off too gradually to avoid disturbing na neighbors. Uh, and uh, most of the site, I guess most light lacked vegetative shielding for light and sound. Most of the sites I looked at, and, and I guess probably one bottom line conclusion is there's no magic lights that are gonna make light impacts go away. Uh, lights, will have, lights in Westfield will have impacts. Uh, uh, some other comments on the Westfield revised plan. Uh, the lighting poles are placed near the property boundary, which makes, makes control of stray lighting difficult or impossible. Uh, you can put a, and one of the things that uh, the, our plan does was with the field boundary uh, right near residences, you can put a field uh, of, I could face our, our revised plan to put a field of screaming teenagers 15 feet from residential bedrooms. And I appreciated this when I was in Scotch Plains. I saw two girls' soccer teams playing, and they were screaming at the top of their lungs. And it's hard, it's hard to believe that the, a bunch of kids could make that much noise. So it's clearly not a workable situation uh, for Westfield. Uh, also, I guess the, our fields are crammed into a small space. In the, in the revised plan, uh, there's low space between the fields, property boundaries, fencing, and field obstacles. Um, there'll also be likely ongoing activity restrictions due to neighbor proximity and complaints. Uh, and it's gonna be a, a, a challenge to, Ill, because the lights are right along the property boundary, it's gonna be a challenge to, uh, to, to, to light uniformly. And what I see in this is possibly a very expensive second rate field. Um, some noise observations. Uh, Scotch Plains High School had very high game noise. It's because, partially because it's in a quiet setting. If you go to Sid Fay, which sits in a setting with a lot of traffic, you don't, uh, the noise is not as, uh, as noticeable, but in, in, for Edison Field is also in a very quiet setting, so the noise will be uh, a problem there. And um, let's see, so, in summary, uh, the, ed the revised Edison Field project would have much higher negative impact than the other fields that I looked at. Uh, it's close to numerous residences. It's got no buffers or setbacks, and it's, it's basically would have a lot of uh, direct lighting glare, which you're not supposed to have. You're not to be able to see. You're not supposed to be able to see the light from adjoining properties. Uh, it'll have noise issues due to residential proximity. And I guess probably a bottom line is there's no magic lights. You put lights in in West Westfield and you're gonna have problems, you're gonna have to live with them. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. My name is Timothy Eaton. I live at 762. <laughs> Timothy Eaton, I live at 762 Knollwood Terrace. Um, increasing field capacity and preserving our neighborhoods, um, this should be a common goal that we should all share. The current Edison Field Plan calls for artificial turf and lighting towers. Um, this will not preserve our neighborhoods. This will cause more noise at night, deterioration of quality of life and home values, excess parking on streets, traffic congestion, safety issues for pedestrians and motorists, flooding, contamination, more injuries on the artificial turf field, and exposure to carcinogens, greenhouse gas emissions. 
We need to increase field capacity through more field space at various locations and researching better ways to preserve and maintain our grass fields, current and any new ones, and not by increasing the hours at night with lights. I tried to come up with an example, maybe something a little bit different, and I, I thought of a situation where if your next door neighbor or your neighbor a few doors down decided to get rid of their natural grass, you know, due to maintenance issues such as seeding, cutting the grass, or fertilizing, and replace it with artificial turf, which would cause flooding and pollutants and carcinogens coming into your yard, and then adding tower lights for nighttime activities with more noise and excess parking and traffic on your street. You would not want this. I certainly would not want this. The Edison Field Plan will do this and more to our neighborhoods. It will be far worse than the example of just your next door neighbor getting rid of their uh, lawn. Natural grass fields at various locations with no lights is really the right outcome. Increasing field capacity and preserving neighborhoods should not be mutually exclusive and one should not be sacrificed for the other. Please support grass fields and no lights. This will preserve our neighborhoods and provide the needed capacity for Westwood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Kircher, 791 Nola Terrace. Um, I'd like to address two, op two topics this evening. First, the Edison uh, Field Project. Uh, we still have health and safety issues and questions that remain. One is traffic. So Rahway is a nightmare. We know that. It's now making the local news, the CBS, because of the near misses and the crossing guard uh, issues that are present now. Um, we won't have crossing guards during games and practices, right? So if it's an issue now and you add traffic, we don't have those crossing guards, it's going to be more of a problem. So during the school year, there will be no respite from the traffic. We'll have early morning AM commutes as we come out of COVID that will not abate until 10 p.m. or after. Right? So there's an impact on the neighborhood there, as well as the increase in pedestrian uh, foot traffic, as well as car traffic. The town and Board of Ed know that this is a dangerous area. There's a hawk light signal there, as well as an expanded two expanded crosswalks that are in place today. So we can't honestly understand if we look at each other across the table in the kitchen at home and say, this isn't going to have an impact, right? Your gut tells you it's going to have an impact, right? Traffic studies and parking studies, I know those will come and be taken care of. But just when you just take a simple matter of fact, common sense, <coughs> common sense approach to it, it's going to be a problem. So safety as it relates to field capacity. So the Westfield soccer justifiably refuses to use some fields today because of the lack of quality of the fields because of their very legitimate fears for, for player safety. That's three to four fields in this town alone that go unused by soccer, right? So 2,000 kids, as we talked about in the September 20th meeting, right? The largest constituency within that sports group. So if capacity is truly the driving force behind this project, why not build properly built grass fields yeah, that are organically maintained for a heck of a lot less than $9 million, right? Our group, Kraft, has done a lot of research in terms of what it costs to build a properly done and capped grass field. Two to $400,000 a piece, right? You can put those together very quickly, right? They can be put in place. From the time the plan was created or even conceived of till now, we could have already increased capacity. Right, at these fields for, as I said, a lot less than $9 million. I think that's honestly a plan we can probably really all get behind. Does it solve the problem? No. Is it the big splash? No. Is it the master plan? No. That's not the point. The point is if capacity is the problem, you can help address that capacity in a financially responsible manner quickly. Right? 
if they've waited 20 years, why make them wait another year or two, right? Yes, this could have been done two decades ago, right, for a lot less money. Second issue, flooding. Um, sticking with the simple, practical, and effective approach to problems, when a large snow or ice storm approaches, what does the town, county, and the state do? They pre-treat the roads. Does that solve the snow and ice problem? No. Does it help alleviate the problem? I think we can all shake our heads and say, yes, it does. Is there a study that says, no, it does, it does or it doesn't? Probably not. But it does, and we do it. We spend the money, right? So what I'm asking for is, why don't we apply that same logic when it comes to a large rainstorm? We live in the Northeast. I come originally from Southern California. Rain is like snow. So we have leaves that fall. We have nor'easters that come. We have hurricanes or remnants of hurricanes, whatever you want to call it, meteorologically. We have two street sweepers, yes? The town knows, I bet the chief can tell us, <coughs> the streets that typically flood in this town. So why don't we apply the same logic? I'm not the smartest guy in this room, by far. We pre-treat the roads for snow and ice events that we know are coming thanks to modern meteorological sourcing. We know typically when these storms come, and I'm not talking about pop-up thunderstorms in the summertime, right? Those come and go, they're gone in 15 minutes. I'm talking about like what happened last night, right? It was supposed to happen tonight, right? So why don't we apply the same logic? I think this is a very reasonable request. I'm not asking to spend new CapEx on more machines or more labor. We have that already. It's a simple reallocation based upon known facts and known storms. Can I tell you, is it an inch or two inch or three inches of what should be considered a significant rainstorm? No, I can't, right? That's for a, a, a bit of a larger discussion, but it's not a protracted discussion. We don't need a big government five month study to figure this out, right? because we do it already for snowstorms, right? So just take these things, please, into consideration, think it through, and let's come up with some simple, practical solutions that help alleviate issues while we work on those larger, salt, larger problems and the roads and solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Jean Lemberg. I live at 528 Grove Street. I would like to extend my congratulations to the Department of Public Works on being recognized by the New Jersey DEP for the DW, uh, DPW's leadership and execution of Westfield's innovative recycling program. I am also grateful that the Green Team and Councilman Contract continue to seek out new avenues for recycling a wide variety of materials. I would like to thank the mayor and members of the town council for taking the time and making the effort to listen intently to each member of the public who addresses you, whether it is via correspondence, private conversation, or here at the podium. I recognize and appreciate that each of you are volunteers. This means that unlike state and federal elected officials, you don't have staff members who you can task with doing research on topics of importance. With this thought in mind, I stand before you again tonight to share recent developments which are relevant, relevant to the decisions that you will make with regard to Westfield's future. Just over a week ago, on October 18th, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, administrator released the agency's PFAS strategic roadmap, which states every level of government, federal, tribal, state, and local, needs to exercise increased and sustained leadership to accelerate progress to clean up PFAS contamination, prevent new contamination, and make game-changing breakthroughs in the scientific understanding of PFAS. TURI, which stands for the Toxic Use Reduction Institute at UMass Lowell, describes PFAS, which actually stands for TUR and polyfluoroalkyl substances, as 
a category of chemicals that contain multiple fluorine atoms bonded to a chain of carbon atoms. PFAS are persistent chemicals which do not break down under normal environmental conditions and some can last in the environment for hundreds of years or longer. As a result, introducing these chemicals into the environment has lasting consequences. Turi also states, all PFAS pose some degree of bioaccumulation concern, especially in air-breathing organisms. In other words, they can accumulate in plants, animals, and humans. Dr. Sarah Evans, a researcher and professor with the Children's Environmental Health Center at Icon School of Medicine in New York City, expressed these concerns. A recent study identified perfluoral alkyl chemicals, a class of chemicals linked to numerous health problems, including cancer, nervous system toxicity, immune dysfunction, thyroid and cardiovascular disease in the plastic brass blades and backing on artificial turf fields. PFAS are persistent pollutants that have been shown to contaminate wetlands and drinking water. These findings raise concerns about PFAS groundwater contamination from field <coughs> turf and emphasize the need for further examination of exposures that may occur from turf components other than infill. Groundwater contamination from field runoff is a very real concern. I walked around the Keller Field track earlier today and saw blades of green plastic grass and white and blue plastic threads strewn on the track. The end zone contained black swirls, which upon closer examination were actually pieces of crumb rubber, which had migrated off the field along with more blades of plastic grass and white and blue line marking threads. Bits of the red orange rubber from the track dotted the cement walkway which circles the field. Blades of plastic grass could be seen clinging to and floating in the drainage slits which run along the track. Equally disturbing was seeing bits of red-orange track material floating in the water that accumulated on top of the storm drain covers located outside of the stadium entrance. I even saw a blade of plastic grass laying on the sidewalk in front of EIS. It is horrifying to know that all of this chemical-laden fake grass is making its way into our waterways. Even more horrifying is the thought that you will allow this hazardous material to replace the natural grass fields that currently exist at Edison Intermediate School and the Memorial Pool at Elm Street Fields. Currently, there are picnic tables situated outside the EIS cafeteria and adjacent to the field, which the Rec Commission has designated as the perfect place for synthetic turf athletic fields. There is no doubt in my mind that blades of plastic grass and bits of crumb rubber or some other infill material will be tracked into the school building every day. I wondered if any of the decision makers, including the Rec Commission, Board of Ed, and you, chose to visit Kaler Stadium when the air temperature was 80 degrees Fahrenheit or hotter. If you had, you would know that as the air temperature increases, not only does the turf become hotter, it also gives off a very unpleasant chemical odor. I could not help but wonder if you would want your children to eat lunch and play in this kind of environment. I also wondered if you are aware of the recommendations which have been made by Environment and Human Health Inc., which is a science-based organization dedicated to protecting human health from harm through research, education, and the promotion of sound public policy. EHHI advises students and athletes who have a history of asthma or other allergic reactions to be especially careful when playing on synthetic turf fields. The Children's Environmental Health Center warns against chemical exposures, which can happen as follows. Through the inhalation of chemicals and particles, dermal contact and absorption through the skin, open wounds and ingestion of turf infill particles. Additional safety tips include 
Avoid use on very hot days. Avoid passive activities, such as sitting, lounging, and picnicking, which would also apply to lunchtime. Avoid walking on synthetic turf with bare feet. Wash hands before eating, drinking, or touching mouth. Clean cuts and abrasions immediately, taking care not to bring synthetic turf materials into the home or school, and showering as soon as possible. Mayor Brindle, I heard you speak at the rally to, uh, for women's rights in Minnawaskan Park on Saturday, October 2nd. You mentioned that local governments are like a petri dish. Decisions made in small towns can impact what happens at the state and federal levels. In other words, decisions made in Westfield can have a cascading effect which are either harmful or beneficial. I hope you will follow the EPA directive to exercise increased and sustained leadership to prevent new PFAS contamination. It is time to share the following message from EHHI with the Rec Commission and residents of Westfield, which, uh, quote, towns and schools have an obligation to have their children and students play on a safe surface, and there is no safer surface than grass, end quote. It is time to lead Westfield, other Union County communities, the state and federal governments to say no to the synthetic turf industry and yes to properly designed and organically maintained natural fields. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Greg Lemberg, uh, 528 Grove Street. Um, I'm also here to talk about the Edison Project, a couple of, uh, couple of topics. The first is a follow-on <clears throat> to the story you just heard about what the EPA is now looking into with PFAS. Um, I'll give you a little, a little bit of story here. Um, my, one of my first jobs out of college was working as a process engineer in the decaffeination R&D group at Maxwell House Coffee. At the time, the standard decaffeination solvents used for decaffeinated coffee for decades and decades had been methylene chloride and trichloroethane. Both of those are chlorinated hydrocarbons, not unlike the PFAS you just heard, which are fluorinated hydrocarbons. So the industry had used them for years. There was limited re uh, regulation, not unlike the synthetic turf industry, which is completely unregulated today. And the reason why there was an R&D effort going into uh, looking at alternative ways to decaffeinate coffee was because the FDA had woken up to the fact that chlorinated hydrocarbons were likely carcinogens. <clears throat> the, ultimately, the FDA did declare methylene chloride and trichloroethane off of the, the allowable list and place them on the list of, of carcinogens. So the analogy here is we now have the EPA looking at PFAS and the, the harmful effects that they have on humans and the environment. So ultimately, assuming that the EPA comes to a similar conclusion to what FDA came to all those years ago, is that even though there's been decades and decades of these synthetic fields around and everybody thinks they're fine, there's a very good chance that that tide is gonna turn and <coughs> it may even lead to the need to remediate these kind of fields. So just take a little piece of history when it comes to <clears throat> the materials that we're messing with here. Instead of having mountains of used tires which were deemed to be unacceptable and a hazardous material. Instead, we've decided it's better to grind them up, increase the surface area by a thousand fold, and increase the rate at which the harmful chemicals emit out of the crumb rubber. So we've got plastic grass with PFAS, we've got crumb rubber with other toxins, known carcinogens, suspected carcinogens, known toxins. We are doing ourselves no favor by proliferating synthetic fields in this town. That's not, that was my first point. My second point is on 
the finances of this project. And I feel like a broken record, but it's because I've said the same thing multiple times and I've yet to get even a reasonable answer of any kind. Nine million dollars for this project is, in, is completely and totally outside of the norms of any other project that I have seen in the state of New Jersey in the last three years, including Maplewood, including Princeton, including Homedale. They've all done projects, single fields, to the tune of about two million dollars. We're talking about two fields and a bit. So do the math. We should be talking about four, four and a half million dollars, not nine. So what is going on with the cost of this project? How could we be continuing with a project of this, with this price tag on it, when it does not fit any of the norms that are, that are out there? Likewise, if you look at uh, literature from the Sports Turf Managers Association, and you do the math on those, the field itself should cost about a million dollars. All the ancillaries with lights and all that other stuff will bring the price tag up. But nine million dollars is completely out of line and we have yet after, I brought this up all the way back at the very first meeting in July over at Edison. I've, taught, I've raised concerns about the costs. I've yet to hear an answer as to why this project costs so much more than all the other projects that are happening in New Jersey that, uh, of a similar nature. Finally, the, a, a resident here on the north side who's become actively involved in this project and in our group has built a cost model looking at the 30-year total cost of ownership of these fields, not using the $9 million figure, but using figures that are more generally recognized from the Sports Turf Council, Sports Turf Managers Association, in terms of what a grass field would cost and in terms of what a synthetic field would cost, both from an installation standpoint, annual maintenance, and most importantly, replacement costs every eight to 10 to 12 years for synthetic turf and resodding for grass every five years. Without stealing his thunder, he would have come here tonight, but he had a family obligation, so I'm gonna steal a little bit of his thunder. I'm hoping that he comes next time. The total cost of ownership for the Edison project, based on the modeling exercise that he did, will cost about $5 million more over 30 years than a grass solution would. And again, that is not starting with the $9 million price tag, that's starting with the same metrics that are being used to compare to grass in the Sports Turf Managers Association literature. So that's about $170,000 a year more, more for a synthetic field solution over that 30 year period. That does not seem like a reasonable solution here. So I would ask that long before this thing comes to a vote, either here or at the Board of Ed, that some proper due diligence be done when it comes to finances. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Greg. My name is Bill Hedden. I live at 811 Knollwood Terrace. <coughs> Let, <coughs> excuse me. Lived there since uh, 1980 <coughs> and in town since my parents brought me here in 1950. Um, I've listened to all the concerns that the group has about safety, health, environment, traffic, congestion. Um, and all the other problems. And um, I don't understand. You did a survey in which a third, approximately a third of the residents said 
we should have turf fields, synthetic fields. And about a third said lights. But 70% didn't have any interest in it. And it just seems to me that a project of this cost and the impact it will have on the town's character, right, is exactly the type of a project that should be submitted to the voters for their approval. But the Board of Ed and the Town Council worked out some deal where you remove that from the ability of the voters to, to make a decision on it. And that just, just uh, defies logic in a democracy like this. I mean, this is a major change in the culture of this town. And there are a lot of people who are really going to be devastated by it. And I think you ought to reconsider and let the people of the town make that decision. Thank you. Hearing none, uh, I close this portion of the meeting and uh, and uh, just a couple comments. Um, some I I see that the senior housing folks left, um, unfortunately. And um, the only comment I'll make is obviously this isn't something that we want to litigate publicly, nor do we have any intention to. It wasn't until senior housing took out a full page ad with all kinds of claims that the town felt compelled to have to respond. So. Um, so I'm sorry they left, so I couldn't respond um, uh, in person. But um, but we will continue. This is, we will continue to proceed um, with this uh, litigation with the uh, senior housing, hopefully privately. So um, I don't know if the town attorney has anything to add to that. But um, and the only thing I'll, I'll comment on um, on the Edison Fields. I just want to assure everybody. Uh, there's no vote imminent on Edison Fields. And I've, I've spoken to a lot of people recently who have reached out to me that are part of the craft and, and so forth um, that just wanted that reassurance. There's, there's no uh, vote happening. There's a lot of information that we still have. I, obviously, there's an election next week that a lot of people are worried about. Um, I think post-election we'll be able to have, you know, uh, a conversation, I think, about what the process is going to be. I know we're waiting for parking uh, assessment that's going to happen, but I just, um, you know, we don't sit up here every two weeks and hear you guys and think it falls on deaf ears. I, and I know certainly the Ward 3 and 4 council people in particular have been tremendous advocates for the neighborhoods. Um, so I, I, I just want to assure everybody that this isn't going to be some dumb deal that we're just voting on and that's it. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen between now and then. I'm at Edison every day at five o'clock, dropping my picking my son up from track. I'm very well aware of the congestion and traffic concerns that you guys experience. I experience it too. So we have no interest in doing anything or not coming up with solutions that's gonna to add to any safety concerns. Uh, so there's a lot of information that needs to happen. I just want you to know, as you have been heard, um, and there'll be a lot more conversations that need to have, and, and, and we'll be doing that. I just wanna promise you that. Um, and uh, I'll be driven to, with the Recreation Commission. I know that they're having conversations with the Neighborhood Advisory Group. Um, it's my understanding that those feedback have been going back to the larger group. So, uh, uh, so I just, I, I, I promise you, there's a, lot, there's a long road ahead of us in terms of figuring out what the right solution is for the town. And I know that there's a lot of concerns about environmentally. Um, you know, I'm really proud of this administration's track record on, on, on the environment. I mean, we've gone from zero to 100, as far as I'm concerned, in three and a half years. So those aren't, those aren't conversations that we take lightly. Um, and so all of that will be considered in terms of anything that we plan that we do going forward. So um, you just have our commitment on that, and I just want you to be assured of that. Um, so with that, uh, let's move on to bills and claims. Uh, Councilman Hapgood. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move bills and claims in the amount of $286,616.06. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. Yes. Opposed? This motion is carried. Next on the agenda is reports of standing committees, beginning with the Finance Policy Committee. Council and Hapgood. Thank you again, Mayor. I have three resolutions tonight that I'd like to move as a package. 
One, a resolution authorizing the CFO to draw a warrant to replenish the postage meter. Two, a resolution authorizing the CFO to refund recreation department fees. And three, a resolution authorizing the CFO to draw warrants for the 2020-2021 pursuant to the Tax Court of New Jersey. May I have a second? Second. Second, second by Council Mackey. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. yes. Aye. Opposed? Yes. This motion is carried. Uh, next, Code Review and Town Property Committee, Councilman Parmalee. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move General Ordinance Number 2229 on first reading an ordinance amending the land use ordinance to supplement electric vehicle infrastructure regulations. May I have a second? Second. Second. Second by Council Agrippo. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Hapgood? Yes. Councilman Parmalee? Yes. Councilman Agrippo? Yes. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boyce? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes. This motion is carried. Last is the Public Works Committee Councilman Contract. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have two resolutions to move as a package. The first is a resolution authorizing change order number one for 2021 various road improvements. And the second is a resolution authorizing the Union County Deer Management Program. I guess just a few comments on that. Um, this will be the third year that Westfield participates in the county program to help call the deer population. Uh, <clears throat> we're pursuing the same locations, which is in Wards 1 at Brightwood and uh, near Tamaquas in the Conservation Center in Ward 4. I do want Ward 3 residents to know that I am working very uh, aggressively to bring this program to Ward 3, where a lot of residents complain about deer. It's much more complicated. There isn't a large parcel like these other two where this program can be run and it involves multiple jurisdictions. So the woods along the, the boundary of Westfield, Cranford and Clark is where the county believes the best impact can be had, but that involves three towns. We passed a resolution in May, asked the county for their assistance. That is still ongoing and uh, I'm still pushing for it. So I know a lot of Ward 3 residents, particularly in the southern part of Ward 3 are very concerned by this and I share their concern and I will keep uh, advocating for them. May I have a second? Second. Second by Councilman Dardia. Uh, any, other, any other discussion? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Um, I would like to make a comment before we break. Sure. About oh, the crossing yeah. guard. Oh, yeah, gonna, I'm going to get to oh. that. Yes. Got a vote on this <laughs> first. All in favor? Yes. 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 Uh, opposed? This motion has carried, and I was going to hand it over to you, Councilman Dardia, for yeah. a public safety update. All right, thank you, Mayor. All right, so uh, we are reinstating the crossing guard at Sycamore and Central Avenue. Um, I just want to provide a little background on how we arrived at that decision. The, the Public Safety Committee met with our uh, Westfield Police Department, Traffic Bureau, our town councilman uh, Logrippo and contract. Um, we uh, looked at the idea of a, uh, a post at Dorian and Trinity. Uh, we worked, uh, well, we uh, proposed the idea of working with the crossing guard there to split uh, her shift in the morning to make that go from 7 to 7.40. And, uh, and then from 7.45 to 8.45, uh, she would uh, post uh, or be the guard at the post at Sycamore and Dorian. So um, that would, in effect, uh, serve those students very well during that time, uh, 7.45 to 8.45, once again. Um, later in the day, uh, we looked at the afternoon shift uh, and uh, decided it would make sense to eliminate that afternoon shift at Dorian and Trinity and uh, move that guard exclusively to the Sycamore and Central location. Again, in the afternoon, exclusively at Central and Sycamore, 245 to 345. Now, we uh, received uh, or was uh, this proposal was well received by ACMS, our crossing guard company. Um, and uh, it's important to note that uh, ACMS has been an important partner to our town. Uh, they continue to be a, uh, and, and have been 
a, a strong partner in this town and have been working really hard to hire uh, for various guard positions. We know the economy being what it is, that it's difficult to do that. But I think they are having some success. And, um, and once again, um, you know, we, we provide them with as much support as possible. Um, also important to note that the, the change that I just described is a temporary change. It will go through the remaining part of this school year, okay, all the way through June 2022. It is temporary, um, but during the spring, we do expect that a third party will be uh, hired to do a full assessment of all guard posts throughout the town, see which makes sense, make uh, suggestions around uh, safe walking routes uh, throughout town, and uh, we uh, hope to uh, put those recommendations into place at the start of the next school year, 2022-2023. Uh, so, once again, this decision is chiefly a product of community engagement and transparency. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure my counterpart here, Councilman Contract, will have more to say about that. <laughs> I just wanted Ward 3 residents to know that um, I heard you. And uh, actually, I'd, I'd like to um, thank the Councilman, <coughs> uh, the Chief, ACMS, the entire Public Safety Committee, for listening to Ward 3 residents, for listening to the solution that I actually came up with to address this issue. It's not easy to add a crossing guard when there are no extra crossing guard resources to use. So you have to actually look creatively and think about where can you deploy your resources more effectively. So my idea, which I'm glad they embraced, was to potentially was to shift part of this resource from the high school to Sycamore, Clifton, and Central and take and really kind of fill two spots with one person. So I'm glad we're moving forward with it. I really appreciate the support, and uh, I think it's a big win for the town and a big win for Ward 3. And I think Councilman Mackey has an update. Yeah, I just want to give everybody, just um, just remind everybody there are a few more Adams Fest events going on this weekend, uh, Friday night at the Rialto at 8 p.m. You can see the cult classic, The Blob. Saturday night, uh, we have been gifted with uh, Adams 2 by MGM. So we're, we have a drive-in Saturday. We've added some tickets. And Sunday, uh, Peter Lyons, local author who wrote the book, Tonight, Tonight is Halloween, will be doing story time on Quimby one more time from 11 to 1. Ron McClowski, who's a former resident and an Adams enthusiast, will be doing a free lecture at the Rialto at 3. And the, um, the, this is the closing weekend of the Adams um, Compliments Art Exhibit, which highlights the work of Suzanne Heilman, a uh, very talented texturalist. And I really encourage everybody uh, to get out there and see the art. It's really amazing, and we're lucky to have it. So uh, thank you, everybody. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Okay. May I have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. By Councilman Mackey. Second? Second. 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 Second by Councilman Hapgood. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Opposed? This motion is carried, and this meeting is adjourned. Right.